<laughs> okay, so we've got some people flowing in. Hi guys, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. We are uh, just going to join, we're going to start in like maybe another couple of minutes. Just to see if a couple more people want to join in. And then we're going to start talking with Rajshree who's right here from Pune. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But maybe what I can do is use this time to talk a little bit about offsets so you know we don't end up using more time later. Yeah. But essentially, hi everyone, I am Anshika and I'm talking to you from my living room in Delhi. Uh, I run a small initiative called Offset Projects where we kind of try and figure out fun and interesting ways to engage with books, but like more visual or artist based books. And um, the idea is to kind of see how we can get photography or visual reading outside of just photographers and visual artists, you know, to actually break, take the book form and engage with people outside of this tiny world we often create for ourselves. And uh, so for that, we have a whole bunch of programs. We do pop-up libraries in universities and schools. So in an artist's garden is what we did uh, last time and that's where I met Rajeshree in fact uh, because both of us were showing our work at Goa Photo and uh, it just happened to be that we were in this exhibition that actually was talking about food and images and so immediately like the minute I saw her work I was very very curious and I was like what's going on here and I spent a lot of time going through <laughs> your booklets and uh, and uh, you know we the whole COVID pandemic over here has kind of brought us to a point where I was like we can't really maybe activate physical reading rooms and pop-up libraries or you know have people attend artist talks but the great thing about it is that now we can talk to anyone who we want to in the whole wide world and uh, you guys can join us. So one of the people that immediately came to my mind was Rajeshree because food is something that I have personally been always very interested in. And, uh, and obviously Rajeshree's research and experimentation to talk about the politics of food was something that I was immediately curious and interested in so when you we were doing this I was like I have to get her on board and she was happy and happy to come on board and nice enough to join in this awkward virtual conversation we are going to have but it's really nice to have you here and uh, right. just to give you just to give you a small introduction to Rajeshi um, that she's from Pune and she studied in sociology, I think, which actually helps her to not get stuck by the dictates of a medium, but maybe more about like the medium gets dictated based on like the context of what she's um, trying to talk about or whatever the subject of research is. And currently she's actually developing a body of work around uh, narratives of food and eating and hunger more specifically in the actually with the Dalit experience as its center and um, and it's led to a series called writing recipes where she's been I mean we'll talk more about it of course over the next half an hour 40 minutes but um, um, she's had a very interesting use of text and cooking and cultural experiences kind of come together and um, Maybe what we can do is start off with uh, one of your books, or maybe the anthology. Rajeshi. Do you want to? Do you want to add or say something more? No, no. I think I think this is great. Just thank <laughs> okay. you for inviting me and yeah, for making me part of this. Um, but yeah, I can I can just start. Um, yeah, I think we're maybe we're a little now. bit. Yeah, let me. No, no, no. Go on. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I began making these little recipe booklets in early 2017 okay. and, um, I guess the, like the reason for starting to make them was 
um partly to do with my interest in food but more with um really how caste plays out in in sort of things that we see as everyday or things that seem central to like every human experience like taste um so and so food actually seemed like a good hook um <laughs> and um yeah and it was just interesting to then um develop this relationship with dalit literature and look at it specifically through um through the focus of food okay. um so i'll just read out a few a few recipes okay uh, maybe i'll share green yeah. uh, i mean what we're also going to do just to give you guys uh, some context of what we were talking about is that uh, writing recipes is actually a uh, kind of an alternative anthology can i call it can i call it that rajeshri or maybe not on to yeah. alternative we will actually yeah. it is an anthology <laughs> you know why why uh, yeah. why keep using this word alternative i feel like it gives it a bit yeah. of a word. so we've got this also but i feel like you know these are very integral parts of history making and yeah. it's actually been making an anthology of um dalit food experiences but also like i think it's not just food related and uh you know uh, rajshree is going to maybe share her screen and show us um, a couple of yeah. books that she's uh, that are part of this work to to help you understand how uh, her project kind of moved with photography with text with poetry and these mm. are um small like a series of small booklets um yeah yeah so the one that i'm just sharing right now is um sort of a compilation of uh, different of recipes from different writers um that i compiled for uh, an event at coach studios in february earlier this year um so it's it's called break the ant hill and eat the queen ant mm. i can just read out a few right um queen ant roam along the stream to reduce the hunger in your stomach catch crabs fish eggs smash honeycombs catch birds like waterfowl tie frogs around your neck search for lizards shoot pebbles at kites with catapults roast squirrels and eat them go to the fields fell the leaves and fruits from trees break the ant hill and eat the queen ant this i've adapted from sharan kumar limbai's book called the outcast akarmashi um the translation um the edition that i read was the 2003 one okay mm Then and just to kind of in a small i just wanted to kind of check and maybe maybe confirm this also but if you could expand on it would be really yeah good. sure uh you know i know that every one of these uh, tiny booklets uh, you know that culminate into a single anthology they're also inspired by different texts from dalit literature itself yeah and so you, i can sort of show how i did them i mean basically Sharan Kumar Limbai he wrote this was his autobiography and um these would be passages in his book so okay. it would really be like we roamed along the stream to reduce the hunger in our stomachs we right. would catch crabs fish eggs this is an experience of his childhood right. um how he was writing about it so what i did was basically just turn it from first person to second person and break it up into um what sounds like re- a recipe like directions yeah. um but it's not quite right. and um i think that's that sort of what i'm not really like as much as i'm interested in in food and recipes i'm not really interested in um sort of creating something that then you can like actually make something from <laughs> uh, um not a good book for you guys to follow inside the kitchen 
Yeah, yeah. but also like, what is a cookbook? You know, what That's, like, yeah. what is um like this assumption that you can uh, really experience another person's culture, perhaps through right. their food, right. and is that ever is that a real experience? Right. Um, I mean, but then I mean, it's sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, no, tell me. No, I mean, I, it's interesting you say that because I think even for me, like when I think about food, like the actual food that ends up on the platter is more incidental to that routine of cooking. You know, like I, I kind of think about cooking as as a ritual. You know, more than more than the final thing that goes onto your plate. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's more about the different rituals that end up reflecting maybe even superstitions, I mean, a lot of superstitious ritualization happens in uh, how recipes were handed over, you know. Uh, yeah. you know I mean, I was reading this, uh, this book that actually Lola had given me. Maybe I'm going a bit off tangent, but I, I'll come. It'll connect eventually. <laughs> but, you know, there was this recipe that was actually a part of the work that I'd shown, which was this recipe on how to make blood sausages. Um, mm. in the 17th century and so that whole recipe and no I mean you kind of got a sense of what you have to do for the blood sausages but more than like ingredients and proportions it was about hey don't sneeze because once you put the sausages in like maybe the fat of that sausage skin is just going to burst and that's going to ruin your sausage you know mm-hmm. which has in some ways nothing to do with yeah. how we would make it today but it kind of makes the experience, I mean, it, it kind of gives you a complete visual of what it is like to be present in a particular socio-geographic region yeah. at a particular point of time. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think more so because um, there aren't really many Dalit cookbooks out there. There, There is just the one, one that I accessed yeah is Annahe Apurna Brahma which is a Marathi cookbook written by a man called Shahu Patore and um, he also connects sort of uh, Dalit memories with the recipes so they're sort of an integral part of the food making Um, and, and also I think because cookbooks sometimes represent different levels of privilege I know we like overuse the word privilege nowadays but um, sort of it assumes an access to a kitchen, certain utensils, certain ingredients. It assumes a lot of things about, about its reader. Yeah. And um, the fact that there aren't really that many Dalit cookbooks um, also tell you something about like, you yeah. need to be able to write to yeah. be able to write a cookbook and literacy is one of the things that like most of the Dalit population has only started to get access to. Um, so just keeping all these little fundamental things in mind. Um, but then when I was looking for these Dalit cookbooks and I was also reading autobiographies at the same time, I realized that wait, we don't, we have the cookbook. In, in our autobiographies, like we don't necessarily, you don't have to make a separate cookbook for it to exist. These like, these stories of food, these experiences with food already exist uh, in these personal memories and community memories that um, maybe there's no other way to put them, you know, maybe there's no other way to like uh, change that really. And maybe not even a need to to a certain degree because I think, uh, like you're saying, there is so little that is kind of understood and known about, uh, you know, the Dalit community and the Dalit kind of experience of living that maybe it is actually really important that the, the cooking is not separate from, from the memory of how that food is created because a lot of the recipes that do exist, like you said, because literature and education has been fairly restricted, uh, you know, yeah. to give access. So the kind of recipes that exist, you know, apart from the other dynamics that we just, you know, kind of dealt with, they are also so 
like everyone's idea of what they cook is so connected to how it was told to them or in what yeah. kind of a situation it was told to them that like when you when you actually have to make what you do have to make you're creating more out of the emotionality of that particular experience rather than like kind of like the sheet of paper of you know 200 grams of this and three things exactly. you know and yeah. so maybe this is actually you know one doesn't need to follow that format of like this very methodical kind of almost to a certain degree dispassionate cookbook making when yeah. we have something that that comes from a different space you know yeah and that tells you so much more about about like how food is rooted uh, right. in in everything that you do um but yeah i can go on to the next one maybe. Sure. um this is called homeland um before eating at a guest's house ask your children to go wash their hands from the window you might hear women's voices asking someone to stop those children before they touch the water vessels you may have traveled through many foreign lands you may have been met with so much kindness but here in your homeland you may still be treated like untouchable mahars um that's really i mean a lot of what you written it's just so powerful that you just you kind of reflect back on so many social engagements that one has witnessed as a child or like moments that one has felt something is not right or right or maybe fought with someone about you know yeah. something but at the same time it's i mean it's written with with a language that's so evocative and, and yet soft you know at the same time and that's something mm. that i also wanted to um maybe maybe ask you i don't know if it is relevant or not but you know in some one would imagine that the reaction to to an experience that you describe in the book would would over a period of time kind of lead to a sense of rage or anger or you know something of along those kind of emotions but i mean in the books in some ways it's again very kind of it's it's almost like you've stepped outside of yourself and you're kind of you you know looking at yourself as a third person entity and so you it's written with a certain level of calm and i mean maybe it's not it, it's very in the description of what it is it's you know i mean i read it and i'm angered but at the same time i'm like it's almost about an acceptance of a scenario that you know from like it will feel like hey so this is how it is done you know it's like almost like a directive in that sense mm. um, i way off or maybe i know. mean this is really like i haven't i can't take credit or the language really because this is from each book like i have tried to make as less changes to the language right. because i think the motive is also for people to go and then read these autobiographies right. um this is just like writing that i've adapted um and made some minor changes and you know broken up the sentences um but that's also what dalit literature so much of it is all about like of course there's rage there's anger but there's also it's it's a lived and a life experience and how can you go through your whole life you know just feeling angry sometimes i mean it's it's always a mix of emotions i mean this one was namdeo nimgade he was um one of the few uh dalit people to go abroad for his studies um he was a close um, i think he was a friend of dr ambedkar's as well um and basically he spent so many years in the us and brought up his children there and um, they got all this love from from people of a foreign land um but then when they came home they were treated like this again right um and that's so much like even even dr ambedkar went through the same thing about you know outside india you're you're treated as mm. just another indian and then here when you come you you're sort of you 
your cast is really yeah, you're suddenly you are by that yeah and even though that's not you like you don't even yeah. um yeah so that that's why i sort of it's like this is not necessarily about food but it is right. that experience like before eating at a guest's house so like what happens uh in this whole process um i mean um, I there's another one that you've got i'm trying to remember which which series sure. it comes in where it's about um, send your pain to this person's house for yeah um, a meal and then you know you talk about that kind of reversal um i'm trying to remember which booklet it was uh, in i think what i'm going to have a quick look i am going to stop let me just uh, stop sharing and find it um that's yeah i i i mean i can't remember the exact section it was in but what was interesting was that it was yeah. about uh you know i mean all of these directions that are saying that you are and you know you're a person who belongs to like a particular kind of uh, i mean you're working in a particular kind of office you have a pn you're supposed to go to someone's house for dinner and it says that you you know um you send your pn to this individual's house yeah uh, I'm, i'm sorry i think i'm and i'll just i'll find it um it but uh, you send your pn over to this person's house and then you realize that when you actually end up going there you'll be fed the meal outside yeah and you ask for where your pn is you realize he's actually sitting indoors with the family eating the meal with them but do not yeah. react to a situation like that you know it's a and i think the idea of the outdoors and the indoors also plays a lot i mean in the text uh, and although you say that um, you would not like to take credit for the sense of language that say i i mean i would i would give that to you completely because you also selected these texts out of a certain body of research you know and yeah particular moments that actually create an echo in like one's memory of of everyday life like you said and so mm-hmm. i wanted to also kind of talk about that sense of what the outdoor and the indoor suddenly becomes like the the implications of being outdoors and indoors in in the context of the dalit experience Yeah I mean I I did find this uh this recipe that you were referring to if I should just read it out yeah and then we can speak about it. it's basically um it's called dinner and um it's from um Urmila Pawar's text called Aidan so it's if the talathi of the village insists that you dine at his place try to fend him off if he does not listen accept the invitation send your peon ahead to see where the house is located the peon might instead perform his first duty of telling the talathi your caste when you arrive for dinner you might be given a lukewarm welcome you might be served food on a plantain leaf in the veranda covered with dirt and filth shoes and chappals goat droppings strewn all around ask the talathi where where your peon is he might tell you the peon will come later glance inside the house you might see the peon sitting inside eating his meal try not to feel as if someone has thrown acid on your face the acid of humiliation turn your back that very instant resign from your job vow never to go back to a village i mean when you were talking about the you know experience of like outside of india you're you're um given a particular amount of status or respect more than status i think respect for who you are as an individual you know like what are the ideologies you stand for what how are you as a person with with your community and and you know it's on individual capacity but the minute you come back no one's really interested in knowing who you are uh, you know to that degree or or what kind of a person you are but they've kind of prejudged and presupposed so much purely by the basis of a last name or the lack of one we can you know yeah and and it yes definitely no no so i mean i was just 
when I mean the outdoors and the indoors works both in the dynamics of whether we're talking in the house of the you know mm-hmm. the yard and and the interiors of the house. Exactly. Plus, I mean, also in terms of nationhood, where you're outside the nation, you know, it kind of gets reversed to a certain degree. But that dynamic still works, you know. Now. Um, yeah. Very. I mean, it's it works on so many levels. I mean, physically, of course, there are there were always like physical boundaries. So in a village, the the Mahar community or, or and the other Dalit communities would always be sort of outside the village, um, a few kilometers away. They'd have different access to different water bodies. Um, so that sort of physical and and Dr. Ambedkar did speak a lot about sort of you know you leave the village like come to the city sort of in a way to to redefine yourself almost um because the city sort of gave one this sense of anonymity and being able to begin again um break down the structures even to a large degree because suddenly the yeah. factor was are you willing to work and are you willing to join this job you know like as opposed to being that being kind of pre decided for you by a community that doesn't engage with you exactly and then when you do come back and people will treat you differently based on your job but then this peon's like first duty is, is to yeah. tell the person that he's communicating with um what the caste is um but exactly these just keep morphing like even in cities now you know you have different areas where different people live like uh, i mean i live in a primarily buddhist dalit area um you know all the different communities live in their own areas so it just kind of keeps repeating itself and now even abroad you know like indian communities abroad are sort of separate themselves they have been visible markings i feel like you know definitely definitely yeah 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 i mean i um, have the experience in singapore like very oddly but uh, so i mean there's and it's interesting i mean it's not necessarily connected in the same way and the same degree of discrimination but there's like the old singaporean uh, community of indians and then there's the new singaporean community of indians and a lot of them are migrant for you know labor as well that's coming in um and i mean right now during the pandemic also like suddenly there was this report of like little india is like one of the hot beds for the for the virus and and everyone's suddenly talking like you hear interviews and stuff and people are just like yeah people are not living properly over there and you know i mean there's that whole thing that's going on but then you realize that also because they're the working force they're like 15 people stuck inside a room as opposed yeah. to the rest of the country which is living very differently you know and so yeah. so those are not conversations that are brought up at all but the immediate thing is to assume that yeah okay they're the working class so they're just not taking care of themselves you know which and there's yeah. like zero conversation on on why that could be so why have you not given them the same provisions in a city as you would you know otherwise mm-hmm. and you also see this very odd kind of discrimination within the indian community there where they like yeah you know but this is like something because there's a caste and suddenly there's like a caste or a class factor which is used to justify that and it almost is an act which means that because you could you could defer it onto a caste or a class you are suddenly not responsible for what you are actively not doing you know in yeah of course in fashion So, I mean this is the same when like you know calamities hit or anything happens like with the tsunami and maybe even now what's happening in West Bengal sort of the people who are then uh, engaging with cleaning up the cities cleaning up the dead bodies cleaning up whatever destruction has happened will always be uh, the dalits will always be lower caste people and there's just this assumed responsibility of um, the like the other citizens not necessarily uh needing to take right. that responsibility mm-hmm. um yeah 
Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we're deferring. Um, yeah, maybe we are. Maybe we should talk back to the text. Okay, yeah. Yes. Huh. Huh. So, I mean, actually, so one of the things that we discussed yesterday was also how you use the text um, from uh, narratives, I mean, from books and literature that you've been reading. And I mean, I just wanted to know what is the process? Like, how do you figure out what texts then end up being um part of this anthology and how I mean what kind of a role the text plays for you in a work like this I mean it's it's sort of like a self um, I don't know it's really the way I keep continuing my practice and and the thing is I haven't read that many Dalit autobiographies yet so the like if I read one I'll make a, a booklet on it it's, <laughs> it just goes on with like um, but it's also a way of, of, you know, keeping on this constant learning, constant like knowledge and like recognizing that like, I'm not here making new material, actually all this material exists and it's my sort of responsibility, not, not necessarily as an artist or whatever, but just like a personal and community responsibility to, uh, recognize that all this is here. And if I haven't read it yet, if I haven't accessed it yet, it's my problem. Um, so the recipes kind of keep me uh, accountable to to like how much I'm reading. Um, <laughs> but there's yeah. also, a, I mean, there is an conscious or subconscious, you can tell me, but this act of fictionalizing from, uh, from non-fiction texts or material. Mm. Because, I mean, of course, we've been discussing the poetry, but you also have, uh, in some recipe booklets, you've also kind of incorporated your own uh, family archives, uh, whether they're reflecting just your own family or a larger community or a neighborhood, you know, in that sense. And although these are from instances that are very real in some ways, they come together to become fictional in one way and representational in the other as well and I was just wondering if you want to kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah sure I mean the family archives also I mean they're as non-fictional as uh, <laughs> possible they're my family photos maybe should I share some of them? Yes. Uh, um, yeah sure um, but I mean I think the only sort of fictionalizing element is uh changing uh, the sort of tense and changing it from like now you as the reader are in the position of of um, yeah the, the recipe maker these are some family photographs um, that I include with the text at times um, this series was called eat with great delight and it's sort of like for me, it's an extension of the cookbooks. Like the the other recipe booklets were based on other Dalit autobiographies, and this is my family. So this is like one more cookbook, um, and it's just centered around pictures of us eating, which which is I guess most family photographs have that. Yeah. Of um, a lot of us in these. Yeah, just eating and and. That way, they're not necessarily very special or unique photographs, but they bring about this sense of um, joy and happiness, um, which I think was important to recognize in um, in these texts. Like the cookbooks are quite complex. Like they have they have moments of joy and they have moments of hunger and guilt. Um, yeah, but I felt the need to balance these more. And I think for me, the family photos do that a little bit. Um, I mean, yeah. now that we're looking at images, there's also, I mean, you've kind of been following uh, this this work or this project, if I may say, through almost like an interdisciplinary format. So, you know, we do have texts that are uh, taken from other Dalit literature we have images from your archives. You've also been working with ceramics and sculpture. And, you know, maybe if we can see an image of uh, uh, one of those, that would... Yeah, sure. Um, and I mean... Uh, yeah. 
Well, I started, I, I did a lot of ceramics again that led from these booklets. Um, sort of started with this quote. So Sharan Kumar Rimbai, he wrote in his book, Bhakri is as large as man. It is as vast as the sky and bright like the sun. Hunger is bigger than man. Hunger is vaster than seven circles of hell. Man is only as big as a bhakri and only as big as his hunger. Hunger is more powerful than man. The world is born from a stomach, also the link between mother and father, sister and brother. And this, this quote, like, just made me really think about the bhakri as, uh, for those who don't know, bhakri is like a millet roti, which is found, uh, like, we eat mainly in Maharashtra. And it's much hardier and cheaper than wheat. So it's considered a real sort of every man's food. Uh, it fills you up fast. Yeah. And, I loved, yeah. and I loved how sort of Sharan Kumar Limbai like made it almost like a devotional thing. Um, like it's so, uh, it's so important to, to the Dalit experience. So I began... Um, making it into ceramics okay. um, and uh, these were just some of the some of the pieces that I made um, like I mean at first they were just experiments because I couldn't I was in I was in Amsterdam and I couldn't actually access real bhakri so I decided to use the ceramic studio to like get the feel of it because with clay also you're doing the same sort of hand movements and <laughs> texture can be similar at times. Um, and, uh, and then it sort of made more sense to continue this because it was also addressing this like inedible side of the food. Um, so these were just plates I made. I didn't make the plate. Is it um, engraving on the plate? That yeah, so it, it's a, it, it's the same thing. It just says the same thing, which is Bhakri is the largest man. Bhakri is right. infinite sky. Um, I mean, uh, just it's really interesting how one and one kind of yeah. draws this parallel between. I mean, hum, like the stomach is also looked as almost like a yoni idea, you know, of like life emerging from there. But he's also spoken about how these structures and like the idea of hunger and the idea of food, they also still come from the stomach. I just, it was just something that came to my mind and, and it was really beautiful. That yeah, it, exactly. It, yeah. Um, put it up. And, yeah. But I need to really take this um, stuff there. Yeah. yeah. And then there's also the larger ceramic. Um, oh, yeah. Thing, I mean, like a setting, I think it was like a dinner or lunch, like a meal time? Uh, um, it was, I'll just open it out. Um, this one was, where is it now? Um, yeah, it, this was yeah. like a lot of little, little bits of ceramics um, that I began making. And I guess you could speak about the sort of fictional element to this as well. Yeah. Um, it's actually where, what brought me to think about it as this kind of like this fictional setting, but also really rooted in a reality that. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, maybe it seems more fictional because it's also a reality that we do not end up encountering as much. You know, and that's that's another thing for us to kind of be more aware of. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this was this was based on a recipe called ukadla. Um, which is what, you know, I don't know, I've been eating ukadla and I thought ukadla meant uh, just heating up the leftovers from the night before and like you just heat it up in a pan and you'll eat it the next day. And we sort of grew up eating it and I didn't really think about it that much until I read Baby Kamri's book and she describes ukadla as a specific Dalit practice that has its roots in um, like say if a Dalit person in a village was a beggar he or she would carry a pot or something uh, and go around begging and then everything would get mixed into that pot ah. you know 
Okay. The rice would get mixed, the bhakar would get mixed, the gravy, and you wouldn't really know what is fresh, what is not. And also, you can't divide things after yeah. that. Once it's all in one pot, it exactly, it's there. And so then, and she describes how you know maybe there wasn't another pot in the person's house. So then you just use the same pot to heat the food again, um, and then that like heated cooked version of that would be your kadla. and it was very interesting to then see my own sort of you know relationships with a term that you know i just grew up thinking yeah food like, like what was left over you mix it up exactly. eat it and then you think that has these roots and and like there's nobody really who will tell you this yeah. like maybe not even close family members like you know either people don't know or they forgotten or or um, or maybe there's an element of shame where like you don't want to talk about these things and what they're rooted in um so this was my sort of ceramic like khichdi version of uh, like my understanding of what ukadla could look like um yeah and i'll stop this now yes i think um, since we're talking about different formats that you're using i mean i'm want to move away from the writing recipes section for a tiny moment and then we'll come back to it but also talk about how like like right after that work that i'd seen of yours uh, we we met in delhi where you were telling me about your uh, the work that you prepared out of pulp and like which also had like again text and the politics of of the institutionalized written word you know kind of comes in uh, over there and mm-hmm. thing because um, like over here you're almost kind of creating this anthology of unread uh, although you know dalit uh, literature is there it is now today a lot more accessible than you know it probably was earlier uh, there's better spaces for dissemination conversation around it uh, but still the act of how you've kind of selected moments out of that to still represent a different kind of uh, an experience i think was one unique thing that comes in from text and then there was the erasure of text uh, you know in a mm-hmm. number of yours and, and you know it'd be nice to talk about how these two dynamics work together like yeah um so i like a part of my other practice is um is taking the manu smriti which uh, has a lot of stuff written about you know how should one treat people of different castes how should one treat women um and it also um like tells you how you know why you shouldn't sit and eat food with a person of another caste and things like that and all these um all these caste rules really have a root in the manusmriti and the manusmriti was written like a thousand or more years ago I mean, it's um, problematic on many, many, many levels. Exactly, like, wow. exactly. Um, and and sort of even though I think I don't know, not many people would have read the Manu Smriti now. It's interesting how its language, the fact that it was in a book, and its language, and uh, what's written in it has been passed down uh, yeah. through it's so many like, generations, through like across the ages. Yeah. yeah and the fact that then the people who were the most discriminated from it and perhaps women too um were the ones who weren't allowed to um access it because they couldn't the manuscripts said that they couldn't read yeah. and like you're not going to read so then how would you so you don't even uh, know what's written in this text that basically puts you where you oh, are right yeah yeah and uh, and dr ambedkar burnt this uh, text in 1927 in december as a way of saying that you know we don't we don't believe in this and uh, this is not our text uh, and since then many dalit activists have kept burning it's not it's not a very common thing but it happens um and it's called manusmriti the handin so it's it's actually on christmas 25th december yeah and so when uh a few years ago i i decided to read the manusmriti myself and um just like highlight everything that is 
Um, but then this really part in that that was not highlighted. Like, did you have yeah, any things? Like, this is so that much reasonable. Yeah, I mean. It, like some of the language is just so wafty, but then you come across things like, oh, if you if 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 a if a shudra hears a Vedic chant, like pour tar in their ears, okay. if uh, if they try and recite it, cut their tongue off, okay, you know, yeah, all yeah. these. Um, and these are obviously the more like, yeah. like, obviously torturous things, but there's so much more. Um, but then I decided to sort of make plain paper out of it. So I started pulping the manuscriti and just making plain sheets um, as a way of just like erasing its words. But but the words are still there. Like it's still it's kind of got like just because we don't of paper down. like we don't read the manuscriti now, but. So many people I know still practice caste. And so sort of how this language was able to permeate into people's lives, um, that it becomes almost like the landscape of the of the area. Um, so I've just that's been like another side of the practice. As my like like I definitely see a strong link in that. I think literacy and access to education is sort of where your voice begins, you know, where you're able to tell your own story, which is also why Dalit literature, not really sort of interviewing people, right. but let's see how people have told their own stories. Like, why do I have to go and like ask someone when people have already written stuff much more? Than, why create um, hierarchy now to say that I am going to like tell you how exactly. that it exists already. Exactly. And I think as an artist to sort of maybe recognize like importance in just sort of oh this is an this is somebody else who's actually done this work and why don't I just highlight that um while giving them full credit yeah. um rather than sort of you know putting pressure on yourself to create something new and something that hasn't been said and all been said. Everything um, been said to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Let's not delude ourselves under that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, do you have Do you have an image of that um, the pulped manuscriti with you? I, I know uh, I'm saying this to you yeah. right now, but it's just um, it just no no that's fine. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, it's interesting yeah, to say sure. that because for me, uh, when I when I saw the work and when I kind of you know when you were talking about it. I was of course thinking about the the act of erasure, but also like this creation of now, like a blank sheet on which today one has the agency to rewrite, uh, mm. you know, uh, non-caste dynamics. Maybe if that's uh, yeah, you know, and and so it leaves that section of it kind of fairly open-ended. Also to say that now there is an agency and there is the possibility for. All of us to kind of get together and rewrite that. Maybe that's just the exactly. Like, I mean, I sort of leave it open. Like I, I mean, a lot of people have asked, you know, why don't why don't you do something with it? Why don't you write on it? Or why don't you sort of? But I think, like, I'm good at making the pulp, and I'm happy for anybody else who wants to write or say something on it to do right. that. Um, but I got some images. Um, yeah, these are the papers on the side. Uh, oh, that's not. Well, I also make laddus out of them. So these are like <laughs> paper pal laddus with the manuspriti, which kind of go into my food stuff. Um, <laughs> but these are like details of the paper. Um, yeah, I mean just playing with sort of right. what it means either to like completely erase it then these are like more sculptural forms that I made with the paper um, and yeah sort of thinking about them more nowadays as a sort of like landscape right. um, that it just yeah anyway keeps going no, no, but this um, point, it's nice to get this visual as well because um, 
I know not everyone would have been able to maybe access these exhibitions uh, previously or I mean now definitely in a different scenario so it's just good to kind of have a visual context and uh, maybe what we can also do is uh, uh, show some of the books that uh, that we've been reading from previously um, yeah sure that would be um, I mean this is so I mean one second not going up for some reason oh yeah here oh. um oh yeah what's going on <laughs> uh, yeah this is this is this like one booklet is called have you lost all taste and I mean it doesn't usually go with the photographs like yeah. but I was trying something out and trying to see whether my own family photographs could fit in this um in these recipe books um and with this, them and some without right yeah yeah i just did one set with the photographs and like cutouts and things um but usually they're just plain right. um so this is cashew wine so um this booklet was based on urmila pawar's book called aidan and, and all, all of these right. are accessible on the book in the book itself yeah this at the end yeah and the the right is credited at the end of the book um and you sort of just read right this i mean they're very sort of plain and like not not too much work but going into it really that's really important because uh, very often uh, one puts so much kind of uh, attention to i mean not dramatizing but maybe to a certain degree dramatizing the that impact that sometimes you're responding more to the other paraphernalia around the material and i think in your case you've been fairly clear about the focus is actually on the writings that do exist and it's kind of giving you know them that quiet space where i can actually read the text without interference from any other yeah 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 i mean that is the point like um i don't know once an artist was like i think he was a designer or something he was like but they're just brochures like this doesn't show me any kind of work that and i was like yeah they're yeah. just brochures <laughs> like that's, that's what, what you make of it i'm not really <laughs> like going around them or whatever like i'm interested in the tech and the text is all sort of written by somebody else originally so how do we just that focus yeah. um rather that, that than there's a lot because it's almost like i mean you know sometimes like artists and designers and i live to myself as photographers there is a certain ego to kind of also say hey this is my presence in the work you know and and i think of course your presence is throughout the work because you you've put it out there you made these pictures you read through these texts you understood the context in which they you know exist and and sometimes that is the presence that's needed you know uh, we don't have to constantly push ourselves into that dynamic more yeah. than that even you know yes, and uh, sorry i just realized because we are nearing into 7 already i don't know how uh, but we do have uh, we have two questions um sure this uh, minar who is uh, who wanted to know how did you make the bakri you know with the text with specific i think interest in the texture and color of that if you can just explain um that. i mean the, it was just like stoneware clay and then different like experiments with glazing um so some were not glazed some were glazed um i'm still very new in ceramics so i mean they, they were mostly experiments um but just trying out with different clays different sort of and sometimes we would put um like actual art or some granules and things to kind of make it a bit rougher and things like that um but i keep it's not a fixed um recipe yet oh uh, yeah it's an improvised it's recipe yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then sky is also here hey we were just talking about you So Sky actually wanted to say, she says, "Hi Raj, could you speak towards how you are working on historical archives? 
where they otherwise do not exist as a way of excavating through history with what is available, which in the case of the recipe poems is language itself. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wait. I wanted to read the question again. It's oh, gone. Fine. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to bring it up. It still exists. Um, Hold on. It's in the no, no, answer no, okay. section. Oh, yeah. It's in the answer section. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we've, Sky and I have been speaking a lot about historical archives that perhaps don't exist and um, really thinking about, you know, who does it not exist for and in what form do they take place that, um, like, who ha has access to them and who doesn't. Um, and so Dalit literature is also, in a way, one of those things where actually the archive does exist. Um, but maybe it existed in other languages that if you do just speak English, you, you can't have access to it. If you don't, if you don't uh, maybe even pay attention to what's going on in, in uh, Dalit literary circles or, or cultural events, you won't be able to access it. Um, so I think it's really about like, how do you turn your own eye towards it? Um, yeah, I think. And then is there a second part? As a way of excavating through history with what is available. Which is, um, yeah, and it, it does that amount of patience and, and like accountability and like commitment to finding these stories because they're all there even if they are just in you know somebody's memory or or they are actually written down but they're not say in a big national museum they're not in like archives that are all online um and i think maybe as people in this um in this scene uh like if we're trying to you know find not new knowledge but like see what knowledge already exists we have to like do that much work at least yeah um yeah, yeah. no i mean I, I agree with you also i think in terms of like what you're saying that i think it's also something that as as artists or or curators like mario who also has a question for you and i'll get to it right after uh you know it is so important for us to also maybe turn conversations to this archive that does exist and how, i mean you know, in that sense, I think what you what you did with making recipes is so important because it's not about the need to create something on your own, but it's also to kind of reread uh, and for many of us read material that we know must exist somewhere in history because like one always assumes that they should be text and they should be these um, memory accounts or they must be even art that you know we have not been able to access. And not yeah. we have not been able to access, but because we have very often shut down the the passages through which it could come to us, you know. Mm. And so it is upon us to kind of break those structures a lot, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, getting down to Mario's question because I think we're, we've got to move on this. The cookbook relates to literacy and food, to fundamental rights denied to Dalit people. How can we think about ideas of shame and emancipation through the format of the book? Hmm. So, yeah, um, answer it if you want. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think with shame and emancipation, with related to a cookbook, it almost sounds like cheesy that a cookbook can sort of uh, address these like very large issues. Um, but I think exactly like with shame and emancipation um, being the sort of larger issues to deal with, there are so many sort of smaller things that um, that build into these larger emotions. Uh, and I think with the cookbooks that allows you to do that, it looks at sort of very small, quiet activities, say, of just, you know, trying to go out and find food like maybe skipping class to go and like look for food in a forest or go steal some bananas and things like that. And um, like maybe you won't, you won't need to like tag that as shame or tag that as like, oh, this is 
little distance but i think these small acts build up in that um right. and a cookbook is a sort of like a friendly way of uh, maybe addressing you don't have your defenses up with a cookbook you know you're in that sense like i feel like you're more yeah and i exactly and that that's what allows you to play with it that i can address these like very heavy issues um but you know people are attracted to talking about food people are attracted to thinking about cookbooks yeah. because that's something that they can maybe consume literally like they can yeah. oh i can make it. and and so i think once you sort of lure people in with this <laughs> yeah. book, then, then they think about what you just did you know exactly um but not in a sort of like listen this is happening um which is required many times um but i th- i enjoy this like game a little bit yeah. <laughs> so, i mean i i i totally agree with you on that we have one more question um from zcd i'm so oh, that you can <laughs> oh, okay yes. um so he or she or, or them yes. i don't know. Okay, I want to say thank you for your wonderful thoughts. Could you speak more about the idea of access to ingredients in cookbooks and how they might be isolating or excluding? As a cook, I find the idea of cookbooks as symbols of privilege so fascinating and complex, and would be curious to hear more about this. Did you see patterns emerging or experiences you've heard, not just from literature but friends or relatives? um the idea of access to ingredients in cookbooks and how they might be um i mean i think a lot of the cookbooks definitely speak about that um you know i don't think you think about in like it being an ingredient necessarily but i do mention water a lot in the cookbooks and how um sort of having to access a well belonging to an upper caste because maybe your well or the water where you get from that's dried up right. um so even access to to things like that um in terms of like experiences i heard with friends and family i don't know not not really but it's um say say there's something called lal bhaji which which my dad told me about um and lal bhaji uh, refers to i mean it's also a vegetable like lal yeah. bhaji is an actual it's vegetable but goa was like that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know but uh, in some dalit households they would refer to lal bhaji as a a, a beef curry okay but you wouldn't want to tell people about it openly right so, so then it would be like oh come home and eat lal bhaji you know because there is that aspect of shame and there is that um um yeah like you enjoy this food but it's also it might get you into trouble it might make people look at you differently so you 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 figure out codes um to this, refer this to it is fact of it um language that comes up in terms of access to material that is not accepted let's just say you know um in the in the larger social dynamics and structures and and i get yeah. which then becomes even more interesting because like i mean for the longest time as as a kid embarrassingly enough to love the whole i had no idea what bade ka meat meant i was just like it's the most amazing kind of meat but i don't know what it is because everyone keeps saying mm. bade ka meat and then you realize it's beef and then you're like okay so that's a pretty cool you know terminology but then you like and i was much younger so it really made me question why do we have to code what we you know it's almost like you have to create the secret secret language to be able to yeah. enjoy something that that you want to yeah okay and now okay. we're going to move into the chat i think we have well sheena wants to say you're amazing which i agree with yes sheena <laughs> and then tanvi mishra as a as another question how much of your work do you see as being subversive because say the historical act of manusmriti dahan or you pulping of the manusmriti or placing lal bhaji on it is obviously subversive do you find a similar subversive idea in the making of your cookbooks uh, do dalit marginalized narratives always have to be seen or be subversive in the current climate hmm 
Okay. I mean, yeah, I guess they would be obviously submersed. Submersed. Uh, submersed. <laughs> submersed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think hopefully the more and more that I sort of continue these practices and, and more people sort of just continue their practice, it won't um, necessarily be given the term subversive. Like maybe this will just be an accepted part of this practice. Um, because say, you know, a lot of, like I do come from a community that, that many people do burn the Manu or eat yeah. like, or have eaten lal bhaji. So, in, in terms of my own point of time, you know, so. right. but that's not like it, it, it's becoming a part of the culture right. that's um, definitely a, a reaction and a resistance to the larger culture. But once it does become a daily practice, um, right. do you feel like it's subversive or do you like, I'm sort of trying to think about it like that. Um, and I don't know. I think I'm just a bit like nervous about using the word subversive wow. because you're automatically kind of trying to poke people, which I am. Um, I think like maybe from a different kind of like, it's not a provocation out of like a very. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's aggressive maybe. Stand, yeah. If that's, you know, I, but I think it's also like thinking, yeah. Like thinking about subversiveness sort of um, as an act of just acquiring knowledge uh, right. as an act of just learning um, and the, the ridiculous fact that like learning in Dalit communities is has been subversive and is still seen right. as subversive so I think it's definitely connected um, but maybe trying to yeah play with both those terms right. yeah just create like Look at the right spots and just see what knows. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um. I think we're going to have to maybe wrap up now. Yes. Um, sure. Thank you. <laughs> no, this was Thank super you. fun. Thank you. And we've yeah. had. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for coming on board and having some amazing questions and. Thank you, Mario, and thank you, Sky, for kind of putting in those really important thoughts there as well. Hopefully, we will all get to see each other at some point of time this year Definitely. and maybe have a more extended conversation on all of these and many more thoughts that, yeah. we're, that are brewing right now as we sit at home. And, uh, and maybe we will see something new from Rajashree soon enough. <laughs> yes. Thanks everyone. Thank you. We're going to have, sorry, I'm just going to put in a little plug for this weekend because this Sunday we're in conversation with another amazing artist, Agni Tanya, and uh, she'll be here to talk about her reading and obsession with New Zealand. Uh, and she's made a couple of books to react to the same and we'll be just talking about that process and what she thinks is the relevance or not relevance of museums today. Yeah. Thank you so much and see you guys on Sunday at 6 and I've, I don't think I put it in uh, Raj, uh, Rajshree's website. I'll just put that in in case you want oh, yeah. to um, see more right. of the time now. In the all panelists. Yeah. Maybe to all panelists and attendees so that they can yeah. see. Panelists is you and me. <laughs> we both have access oh, to <laughs> yeah. um, all panelists. And yes. So thank you. I hope you have a great evening. And I wanted to say these uh, books are also accessible on Rajshree's website. You can read. Yeah. There are all those online PDFs that you can read over there. And it, I mean, I, I really think you should spend some time on that website. <laughs> but yeah, thank you and have a nice evening. Bye bye. 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 Okay, I'm going to end this and then I'm going to call you. <laughs> Great.